Hello, my name is Mark Taylor and welcome to the Education on Fire podcast. The place for creative and inspiring learning from around the world. Listen to teachers, parents and mentors share how they are supporting children to live their best authentic life and are proving to be a guiding light to us all. Hello, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for spending some time with us today. We have a bonus episode for you, which we'd first released on the Learning on Fire podcast. But as we've been explaining over the last few weeks, we're bringing everything under this Education on Fire umbrella to make it much simpler for everyone to tune in, to have access to, to subscribe and make the most of exactly what we're doing in one particular home. And today I'm re-releasing Jonathan Levy's interview that we did back in September 2019. And he's the creator of the Superhuman Academy and has a, a book called The Only Thing That Matters. And he explains in this interview some of the struggles he had when he was learning and how he actually managed to create a life and a learning environment that supported him and how he's been able to go on and create these fantastic resources and, and businesses for you, which are supporting hundreds of thousands of people around the world, which is is an incredible gift in itself and also some of the great advice that he'd been given and some of the resources which he recommends that's enabled him really to live life on his terms but also to be a service and affect so many other people around the world so i hope you enjoy this bonus episode this is jonathan levy and if you want to find out more just go to educationonfire.com forward slash super learner and we'll have links to all the things related in the today's episode there comes a time in every person's life when you realise it's not about doing what you are told, but doing what you know is right for you. Let us take a journey of learning and discovery with the world's most successful people who are living the life of their dreams, walking through life using their inner wisdom and being of service to others. Forget exams, grades and test scores. What is your purpose? As we let go of what we think should be and learn from our elders to gain knowledge, inspiration and a true sense of who we are. What are your dreams? Does your life have meaning? Are you living a life of significance? Let's talk with today's guest. Hello and welcome as we spend some more time together on the Learning on Fire podcast. Today I'm talking to Jonathan Levy. Hi Jonathan, thanks for joining me and let's explore the journey of who you are. Love it. Well, first off, thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to talk to someone who's as passionate about learning uh, as I am. So I'm really excited about it. And who I am, that's a, a really great question that I think varies depend on uh, depending on what I'm doing on a given day and how I feel about it. Um, I identify as a serial entrepreneur. I've had a number of companies throughout my life. Most recently, for the last six years, I've been involved in learning at various levels. I uh, teach one of the web's largest courses on accelerated learning, memory, and speed reading. I have a podcast called Superhuman Academy where I explore some of the world's uh, most interesting and successful, whatever successful means to them, people from professional athletes to world memory champions to people who've achieved superhuman feats of endurance and beyond. And uh, my latest book coming out September 3rd is called The Only Skill That Matters, and it's about why I feel that learning is the macro skill, the kind of meta skill that allows you to achieve anything you want in life. And then on top of that, I own superhumanacademy.com, which is kind of like, we like to call it the Netflix of personal development, where we produce courses for other top thought leaders and people can check out and learn from some of the world's uh, top thought leaders. Great. So we've there's, there's a lot to dive into there, and obviously he's going to be keeping you very busy. And I, I see you've got a team <laughs> literally from across the world, so it really is quite a large organization that you're you're in control of there. I am very very blessed to have uh, really smart people around me who keep me from uh, screwing everything up. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and one thing I just want to pick out just right at the very beginning because I'm a professional percussionist, um, went to London and went to music college and have been blessed to, to travel around the world and do some great things. And I see music as one of your hobbies, one of your passions as well. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So I uh, I wouldn't call myself a musician by any stretch of the imagination, but Uh, I realized very recently, I have this habit where I'll get really interested and obsessed with something new that I want to learn. And I could list off 20 of these different things from learning about cryptocurrency a couple of years ago to piano, guitar, Russian, Hebrew, Spanish, uh, acro yoga, Olympic weightlifting. I get really obsessed. I learn 
as much as I possibly can. I just devour through the subject. And then as the learning curve starts to flatten out, I get bored. And I came to realize that my real hobby is learning. So that has taken me into a couple different musical instruments, also including the harmonica, but I wouldn't say that I'm uh, particularly gifted at any of these. Uh, I did go through a period a couple of years ago where I became fascinated by music theory and was spending hours every week just diving in and trying to learn as much as I can about the piano and music theory and why it works and how it works. In, I, I can that sort of whole learning process thing, and certainly as a musician, it's one of those things that the more you do that, it's you know that passion. It, the more I did, the more I wanted to learn, and the more you got into it, and the more you started to have to know yourself, especially from a performance point of view. And it's interesting mm-hmm. that it's the theory that really got you, which I can really understand based on all those other things that you said you were so passionate about. Yeah, I realized that music theory was a gateway to being independent with a musical instrument, that if I didn't want to always be dependent on tablature or sounding it out on my own, that I needed to learn to read music. And if I wanted to be able to just play something once I'd heard it, or I wanted to be able to play with other musicians, I needed to know what it meant when someone said, we're in the key of G minor, you know, and, uh, and from there it kind of just went on although i don't think there is a key of g minor i'm a little rusty yeah there is yeah you're absolutely right okay yeah, okay good yeah. <laughs> <laughs> great um so what does your life look like now and how is it different from when you were growing up wow so my life today i uh i live in tel aviv which is judging by my accent i'm sure most people will say that's probably not where you grew up (laughs) i grew up in silicon valley i live in israel with my wife uh, in tel aviv and i run a remote company we have employees in five different countries depending on how you judge five or six different countries Uh, and we produce online courses i i work kind of when i want to Um, sometimes i work when i don't want to but most of the time If I want to take the day off, I take the day off. And my job is to help my organization empower as many people as we can to live non-conventional lives through discovering the uh, limitless potential that they have, whether that means teaching courses on productivity or teaching courses on accelerated learning, podcasting with uh, top thought leaders and, and authors, And yeah, I mean, I I try to work out four times a week. I try to do a pretty rigid routine of breathing exercises, meditation, stretching, all the things that I've learned about in interviewing 250 of the world's top uh, experts. And, you know, try really to to take really good care of myself. I think... um, How am I different today from how I grew up? I'm, I'm very happy with who I am. And I love myself, which I could not have said at, at the ages of probably 12 to 17. Uh, I'm content with who I am. I, I know who I am. And I know that I'm able to grow and change and improve that person in the event that I discover something that I don't like about him. So that's, a, that's been the really big difference in my journey. And it is why I titled my book, The Only Skill That Matters. And just just take us into that a little bit. Do you think that had you had the experience, had you had the knowledge you've now got, like you say, from all of those interviews and all the people you've been involved in, if you had that when you were in your teenage years, do you think it would have helped you? Do you think you need to sort of have the teenage angst in order to, to find where you are a bit later? What's What's your thought on that? It depends how you could transmit the knowledge. I think if someone, you know, zapped it into my brain or downloaded it, it probably would help me to some extent. Though I do believe all knowledge comes from the outside, but all wisdom has to come from the inside. And I think to take it kind of even a step further, I don't think, and and I always like to joke about this in interviews, I don't think someone goes out and reads the number of books that I've read and interviews the number of people that I've interviewed and starts a podcast and website called Superhuman Academy because they had a a wonderful peachy adolescence. (laughs) I think that you have to experience that pain, that not to sound melodramatic, but that deep loathing of self to get to a point where you go, you know what, I just can't live with this person anymore and I'm either gonna change it or you know, the alternative, which thank goodness I, I never seriously attempted 
Um, but a big turning point in my life was when I realized it was when my uncle Ernie, who's no longer with us, he was kind of like a grandfather figure to me. He kind of heard from my mom that I'd been having social problems and that, you know, there were calls home that, that Jonathan's really depressed and, and he, he somehow understood that this was a social thing that which ultimately was a learning thing that other kids were learning the social skills that you need to survive at the age of 12, 13. And I wasn't, and it was just one of many things in and out of the classroom that I was not learning as fast or as successfully as other students. And he handed me a book and I'll let you guess which book that was, but he said, this will solve all the problems you'll ever have with other people. And in that moment, I mean, I read the book, I devoured it, and I've read it probably five or six times since, I realized that words on a page or words in a spoken lecture or some piece of information captured by someone else at some other time could actually fundamentally change who I am, make me a better person, and therefore make me happier with the person that I am. That's so great to hear and I think it's a really key point and, and, and the reason that this podcast was so important to me was the fact that the, the, the way you described the, the wisdom and the knowledge and the learning I think is absolutely perfect in as much as what we know is that experience is key we're all on a journey we're all learning many things in our own way but actually understanding that you have access to more if you need it, when you need it, to, you know, to, to come across these books and podcasts and things where you can hear that other people have had the same struggles and how they found their journey within it, I think just means like exactly what you said. You have exactly the opportunity to change that if you want to. And these are just gateways for, for that to be the case. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, Mark, my life experience has taught me this. And then just about every interview that I've I've done with some of the world's top people has reaffirmed this, and I think Hal Elrod is the one who who most succinctly and beautifully articulated it. If you want to have a certain kind of results, you can't just perform the steps that other people do. For example, if you want to be a billionaire, a technology billionaire, you can't just wear black turtlenecks and New Balance shoes and round glasses and show up at Apple every day. You know, you actually need to become the kind of person that naturally gets those kinds of results. And this has been a, a, a lesson that I've learned time and time again. You know, I spent, to kind of draw this back for people, that learning is really not just about your career academically or professionally. It's about everything you do in life. I had this one problem after I fixed all these other health issues and pains and and all these different social issues and self-esteem issues through learning, I had this one lingering thing that I just could not fix. And it was that I was not able to get into a healthy, happy, successful relationship. And after about nine years, I looked in the mirror and I said, how am I going to solve this problem? And the, in the end, I said, I'm going to solve this problem the exact same way that I solve every other problem. I'm going to learn how to be the kind of person that is in a healthy, happy, successful relationship. And it, I did. And I, I read a lot of books and I talked to a lot of people and I interviewed all kinds of people and I did what it takes to become that kind of person because ultimately that's what learning is, right? It is a software upgrade that changes who you are and how you show up in the world, very simply. Um, and I did that. And a few months later, I got into a relationship and, and a couple of years later, I was happily married. And it really is interesting, isn't it, that you can actually you don't know how it's going to result but like you say you've put those things in the understandings there and the rest of it you just allow it to happen and and that's often the case and often the way that it works out yeah because fundamentally i, I think every time you learn something you are changed you can't you can't really unlearn things and so whether that means becoming more aware about economic injustice in your home country or it means learning some incredible piece of new technology at your job you can't unlearn that. And once you learn it, you will behave differently as a result. And what was valuable about your school experience? Yeah, well, a, a lot of different things. I mean, one, I had for all the suffering that I did and, and, you know, nobody beat me in school. So I say suffering fully knowing that there are people who had it much worse than I did. But for all of the unhappiness and not fitting in and almost being held back and parent teacher conferences that went poorly, 
I had a few teachers who really left an impact on me and and gave me the skills that today I look back and go, where would I be without that one teacher? Um, the fact that I write for a living and and also work with other thought leaders and experts who are, are so gifted in their field of study, but I work with them to formulate their words and extract their knowledge in a way that people understand. I owe that so much to my sixth grade core teacher, which core, you know, being English and, and other studies. Um, the fact that I have this fascination about the way that economies work and the way that businesses work, I owe that to my 11th grade economics teacher and on and on and on. I think probably though, the most valuable takeaway that I picked up in my schooling experience was the value of autodidactic learning. Cause Mark, I had this, this problem where I couldn't pay attention in class. I was the class clown and I didn't learn the way that other people learned. And the way that the teacher explained might make sense to other people in the class. And to me, it didn't connect. So my strategy was I would goof off in class or do yesterday's homework, which I, I hadn't gotten around to. And then I would come home at 3 p.m. I was along about age 15. I was prescribed medication to be able to sit still and do my homework. So for at that time, I would come home, I would take my medication, and then I would just catch up with everything that I hadn't understood. And what that taught me, why that's a valuable skill is I learned that just because I don't learn the way that other people do doesn't mean that I'm not going to learn it doesn't mean that I'm stupid. It just means that I learn differently. And that gave me this huge advantage because I think so many people don't realize that until they get out into the real world or they think that learning is something that only happens in schools or formal organizations or maybe at work and they don't realize that that is just a fraction of the learning you'll do. And, and the most powerful learning that you'll ever do in life is autodidactic learning, the things that you decide on your own to learn. So, you know, at age 13, I taught myself HTML because I realized, well, wait a minute, if I can, if I can catch up on, on American history when I'm at home, what else, what else can I learn? I, I have this computer, I have this internet connection, what else can I learn? By the age of uh, 15, I was learning how to mix music and uh, I opened up a DJing business where we would DJ local parties. By the age of 16, I opened an e-commerce business, which grew to be one of the fastest 5,000 growing companies in America. And it was, I, I knew none of this, I just taught myself. I taught myself HTML, I taught myself marketing, I taught myself how to build websites, I taught myself how to advertise, I taught myself how to build supplier relationships. And I don't think I would have done any of that if I hadn't had that realization that if I want to learn something, I can and I should go learn it on my own. And just take us a little bit into how you came to that conclusion, because you hear so many people talking about, you know, I don't fit into this system, I don't like school, I don't learn in that way. How did you get um, on your own deciding, I know I don't understand it in the way that I'm being taught, but I know that I could learn it and I'm actually going to go and do it on my own as opposed to the kind of school's just not for me, I'm going to goof off, I'm not going to do anything. Mm -hmm. Where, where, mm -hmm. where did that thought process come at such a young age? Well, I, I knew that I was, I knew I wasn't dumb because I could figure things out at home and I'd, I'd shown aptitude to building things around the house or learning about animals and, and so I don't think I ever thought that I was dumb I, I now don't really believe that anyone is dumb, but I also, it's, it was kind of a necessity as the mother of, of invention because up until, you know, freshman year of high school, it's kind of okay if your grades aren't so good. Like, I don't remember there ever being a real consequence. I remember a lot of, you should pick up your grades and this is no way to be, but I, I don't remember there ever being a real consequence. By the time you hit freshman year, at least in the US, it's like, your future is on the line here, kid. You need to get into a good, a good university. And if you don't get into a good university, or never, you know the whole rigmarole, which is increasingly less true, I believe. But that was the kind of rhetoric. And I, I realized like, I mean, I had realized as early as eighth grade that I didn't want to be a loser, right? I, did, I didn't want to be someone, and, and I have no judgment of anyone who's not, uh, you know, doesn't have higher educate, education, but I didn't want to be someone who lived off my parents for the rest of their life. And so 
as early as eighth grade, I was like, well, there's no programming classes in school. I'm going to learn. I'm going to try and teach myself JavaScript and HTML and stuff like that. When it came to applying that to schooling, I mean, I think I'd already learned that lesson because, you know, I wanted to learn Java and there was no way to learn Java in school. So I, I just bought a textbook. I didn't successfully learn Java. It was extraordinarily difficult for me, but it opened up this idea of what else can I learn? And then along about the time where grades started to matter, I said, well, I've got to find some way to close this gap because I'm not performing. In my first semester, I, I performed so poorly. I just wasn't surviving in that in that high school environment, so I had to close the gap somehow. And the only way I think I knew how was to just come home and, and relearn everything that I was supposedly learning in class. It's interesting because when I, when I teach um, some of my pupils the drums and percussion, one of the biggest things that I I've always forget, and, and it's always a big takeaway when it comes back to me, is, oh, but I can't do it like this. And then because it's one to one, often you know, but try this, try that. How about thinking of it like this? And you go round and round, very many different ways, and you build up that relationship week in week out, and you start to understand that this person works like this, this person works like that. This we can do orally. This we can do from learning the music, and then and then the percentage of those combinations, and I think for the student in those situations when they realize that it's they don't have to do it a certain way they just have to do it their way and i can support them how to do that that that's a real that's a real eye opener for them and and i think i think for you to have actually got to that point and understood it on your own i think is a is an incredible feat yeah and you know mark i i love what you said because one of the things we teach in our super learner masterclass is just the skill of asking questions because there's this magical thing that happens when one human being explains something to another human being where information is communicated in waves and it's just incredible, but it doesn't always work. And the way that one person explains something may not make sense. No matter how amazing of a teacher they are, it may not make sense that way to another person. So the skill of asking intelligent questions as opposed to, I don't get it, can you explain that again, is such a massive uh, skill, especially for people who, like me, struggle in an academic environment. So we actually teach students, and and you know it's not the bulk of the course, but a small portion of the course is how do you ask intelligent questions? For example, Mark, I understand that you're saying now rephrase it the way that I understand it. Is that correct? And that allows you to step into my mind and go, okay, I see where Jonathan went wrong. I'm going to take his metaphor, which is how, you know, the mental model that's working for him, and rearrange it. But how many times do we, first off, not ask questions, which is, you know, in in um, in Judaism, you have this Passover Seder where they talk about the four children and, and you know, the, the, the dumbest child of all is the one who's who's afraid to ask or or not even wise enough to ask the question. So I think the only dumb there are no dumb questions, only people who are too afraid to ask questions. And, and that that's dumb. So. Um, you know, we, we teach students, first off, I think if you ask questions in a certain way, they're, they're less embarrassing because nobody likes raising their hand up in the middle of the class or even on, in a one-on-one -on -one situation and admitting, I don't understand. But if you go, here's what I understood, that saves a lot of face and makes people a lot more comfortable. Or saying, I understood everything in this way and this way and this way, you lost me at this one part. And that allows you to then come in and serve me better and it allows me to feel comfortable because I don't feel dumb. I just said I understood everything except this one piece. So getting comfortable with asking those questions and asking really high quality questions is an amazing learning skill. I think that's really key. And I think from from a student point of view, I remember when I was at music college, the one thing that really struck me, I, I was privileged enough to have three incredible teachers right at the top of the profession here in the UK um, but they're in slightly different fields one of them was on timpani one was on orchestral percussion one was on sort of drum kit and world music and they were very different personalities and very strong in the way that they came across in their beliefs and their understanding but what I noticed was was that despite their very different personalities and way of approaching things there was a thread of truth that went through all of it about having to be in the music to perform it about the understanding about the overall way that music comes across to other people 
And from there, I think that was exactly what you were saying there. You could ask questions to each of those teachers in a different way to pull more out of what they were talking about, which didn't necessarily come across the same with each each individual teacher. But it meant that I felt certainly secure enough to feel like now I understand the essence of what they're about. And now I can just take that on board and make it my own. Absolutely. Absolutely. Who did you admire when you were young? And what was it about that person that had such an impact? That's a great question. How young? Th- through your sort of school into end of high school young? Mm-hmm. So I think I always admired entrepreneurs because they were the examples around me. Both of my parents were entrepreneurs. My uncle Ernie was a retired entrepreneur. My best friend and neighbor, his father was an entrepreneur. I didn't, I mean, growing up in Silicon Valley, I didn't <laughs> have a lot of great examples of salaried employees, at least not on my block. Now today, you know, so many multi-billion dollar Silicon Valley companies have have grown that, you know, if you look at it, some of the wealthiest, most successful people, successful by the kind of standard uh, metric of, of financial life balance, things like that, they are, you know, execs at these companies. But I always very much admired uh, entrepreneurs. I think I admired Steve Jobs quite a bit. I admired Benjamin Franklin quite a bit, who was also, many people don't realize, a very successful entrepreneur. And yeah, those those were my role models to the largest extent. Like it, entrepreneurs, I mean, it, I wanted to start my first quote unquote company when I was four years old. I had a, a business idea that I came to my parents with. I sh- actually started my first company when I was twelve years old. Um, and it people often ask, like, you know, what made you so brave or so bold to start a company at that age? And it, it was like. I kind of just thought that that's what you do because those were my role models. You know, <laughs> if I wanted a, a new bicycle, every adult around me when they wanted to make more money to buy a new house or or pay for their kids' college, they just opened their own business. So um, I, I give a lot of credit, uh, you know, to to the entrepreneurs in my life. And I think the people you surround yourself with is incredibly important you know and the quote of you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with is is very true and and I hope that by listening to so many people that we chat to on this podcast that actually you start to hear these things over and over so even if the people in your in your hometown aren't quite like that or people that are in your school don't think along the certain ways that you do that you can hear enough of these people who are coming in just saying Mm -hmm. I did it like this I did it like that this is who I was taking inspiration from so that you think oh actually there's a world out there beyond my immediate and I think that's a really key factor absolutely and if if you're not in an environment where learning and growth and ideas are prioritized it's worth changing environments and yeah and i think in this digital age isn't it you, you that environment you can find very quickly and you can have a community of people all over the world that are there rooting for each other but rooting for you too and i think the the one thing mm-hmm. i've found is i've sort of got more and more into this online world of podcasting is that the support and the and the goodwill that comes from people just wanting to support everybody to live their journey in the way they can it's just incredible it's an incredible thing to feel right what was the best piece of advice you've ever been given and who gave it to you? Well, I think indirectly that piece of advice from my uncle Ernie that you have a problem, pick up a book and read about how to solve your problem. He, he didn't say it in those words, but if you looked at his life, he lived it. And, you know, he was he escaped the Holocaust when he was four years old, went to a country that he spoke none of the language in, which was the UK, lived there a few years and then came to the US and had had no education whatsoever, but just learned everything he needed to do to become a successful entrepreneur, successful family man. I mean, he didn't even have an example of family life because his his parents were taken in the Holocaust when he was four years old. So think about all the learning that he did. Um, and he lived that example and and in so doing gave me that advice, which was, you have a problem, learn your way out of it. Whether or not you you rely on the help of others to teach you or whether you rely on a book or a lecture, but you learn and you find your way out. My father also gave me a, a really valuable piece of advice, which was along those veins. He used to always tell me, Jonathan, what you have in your pocket, anyone can take, but what you have in your mind, nobody can. And I've, I've really taken that to the bank, I think. <laughs> <laughs> 
And what advice would you give your younger self now? You know, I, I'm hesitant because the butterfly effect would, would tell me that if I gave my younger self too much advice, then I might not be who I am today. And I, I rather like who I am today. It took me a long time to get to that point, but I really like who I am today. So I think I would, I might just say everything will be fine. There is value and there is reason and there is purpose to everything that you're experiencing now and just love yourself. Improve yourself, but love yourself along the way. I think that's great advice. And, and I think one thing that struck me very recently, I was, I was just walking around a, a local shop recently and I saw so many different people in different seasons of their life. Um, there was a, a family with a very small child sort of herring around. Um, there was a, a middle-aged couple pushing, I assume was um, an elderly um, relative in a wheelchair. And, and I just remember sort of various stages of my life, you know, being in, the, in those different scenarios, you know, with my grandparents or our kids when they were young. Um, and thinking back to me as a teenager growing up and and they are all seasons they all have their benefits they all have what they are and I think that loving yourself and I think accepting of where you are because if you're a teenager you can't be 20 and you know and if you're if you're in a position where you're looking after a child or you're looking after an elderly person then then that takes priority it is what it is and your life looks different than it will be maybe in five years time or 10 years time and you don't know how that's going to pan out and I think just that acceptance is a real key factor. Yes. And, you know, the old saying, you you win more flies with honey than with uh, vinegar. Well, it also applies to yourself. I, I'm all for self-improvement, you know, and I'm, I'm all about if you don't like something about yourself, don't accept it. Change it within reason, of course, uh, because that's how I live my life. And, and I believe that every single day you should be a little bit you should become a little bit better than you were the day before. But it's a heck of a lot more effective if you do that from a place of love and compassion than it is from a place of self-hatred. And I can tell you because I've tried it both ways. What does your future look like? That's a great question. I, I really hope that my my future looks like being a really engaged dad. Uh, that's my next learning challenge is parenting. And I'm I'm really excited to take it on because I think in the business world, I've, I've maybe achieved a lot of the things that I wanted to achieve or decided that the things that I wanted to achieve were things that I shouldn't achieve, that were maybe things I wanted for my ego and not actually for the betterment of my life or the life of those that I love. And so I really hope that the, my future looks like continuing to empower people but relying on the fantastic teamwork of others to have the same or greater impact with me being less and less involved so that I can focus on my family and myself and the things that bring me joy and passion. Yeah, absolutely love that. What book, podcast, video, film, song or or resources had the biggest impact on your life and why was that? Awesome. I, I'm really glad that you asked in plural and so I can list. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So the book that my uncle Ernie gave, if people are wondering, was Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. Yeah. Uh, that That's usually my go-to answer of what's impacted my life the most. Eckhart Tolle's A New Earth also deeply and profoundly impacted me. I have to give credit to Tim Ferriss's four-hour work week because that really changed the way that I think about or thought about what my future should look like. Uh, when I was working 120 hours a week and and imprisoned in a jail of my own making. Podcasts, um, there have been a few. Sam Harris had a chapter uh, of his book, which I heard in a podcast on the Tim Ferriss Show. I ended up reading the whole book. But it's called Drugs and the Meaning of Life, which really impacted me uh, and changed my thinking on the word drugs and drugs as a whole as a category. And... Um, also, the book Sam Harris' is, uh, Lying really impacted me as well. And for those people that are obviously enthralled by what you've been saying, and, and, and there's, you know, we could, it sounds like we could probably chat for hours and hours, especially as you started mm-hmm. talking about some of those books and some of the things you're into. It just I, Another million questions started to come to mind. Um, but if people want to find out more about you and start to investigate who you are more deeply, where can they find you? Yeah, the first and best place is to visit superhumanacademy.com. That's where we teach our accelerated learning, memory, and speed reading masterclasses, as well as many others on health, personal productivity, creating a meaningful life, digital declutter. I mean, we have a whole library and we're growing it every single month and people can join that for one really low rate. 
um, which is $49 a month. And people can also check me out on Twitter and Instagram at entrepreneur, N-E-W-E-R at the end. I'm on Facebook, which I can send you a link for the uh, show notes. And yeah, I, I would also encourage people uh, to check out my new book, The Only Skill That Matters. It's being published by Lion's Crest on September 3rd. And that tells a little bit more of my story, but also weaves it in with a lot of the techniques, skills, and strategies that are being used by the world's top learners, people who set world memory championship records uh, to do incredible things with the human brain and really exceed the limits of what we think is possible when it comes to learning. That's fantastic. And you're absolutely right. We're going to have links to all of these things on the on the show notes. So if you go to educationonfire.com, you'll be able to get exactly that straight away. So thank you, Jonathan, for sharing your wisdom and allowing us to learn from your wonderful experiences. It has been a pleasure, Mark. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for listening to the Education on Fire podcast. For more information of each episode and to get in touch, go to educationonfire.com. Education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire.